Hey there, amazing people. Today we're diving deep into the world of philosophy with four powerful lessons that can transform the way you see yourself and the world around you. We're talking about being inspirational instead of just seeking inspiration, breaking free from the chains of guilt, practicing kindness even when it's tough, and seeking higher pleasures that truly elevate your life. Sounds intriguing, right? Have you ever felt like you're constantly chasing inspiration but never quite catching it? Or maybe guilt has been weighing you down, making you feel trapped and unable to move forward. And let's not forget about kindness. Is it really as simple as it sounds, especially in today's world? And what about pleasure? Are we settling for the superficial when we could be reaching for something deeper and more fulfilling? Stick around, because we're about to unpack all of this and more. By the end of this video, you'll not only have a fresh perspective, but also practical steps to make these philosophical concepts a part of your everyday life. Today we continue our self-development series. If you missed the last episode, the link is in the description. These lessons are a daily life curriculum, so subscribe, and stay tuned. Enjoying the series? Like the video and comment, keep it up below. Ready to get started? Let's dive in. Lesson 1. Don't be inspired, be inspirational. Your philosophical guide to shining your own light and lifting others up. All right, folks, let's talk about inspiration not the kind you get from scrolling through Instagram or watching motivational videos on YouTube, although those can be a nice pick-me-up. We're talking about the deep-rooted, soul-stirring kind of inspiration that comes from within, the kind that fuels your passions, drives your actions, and leaves a lasting impact on the world. The Inspiration Illusion we live in a world that's obsessed with inspiration. We follow influencers, attend conferences and read self-help books, all in the hopes of finding that spark that will ignite our own inner fire. But here's the thing. Inspiration is fleeting. It comes and goes, like a summer breeze. And relying on external sources of inspiration can leave us feeling empty, unfulfilled, and constantly chasing after the next big thing. As the philosopher Nietzsche put it, he who has a why to live for can bear almost any how. In other words, true inspiration comes from within, from our own sense of purpose, our values, and our passions. The philosophical flip. Instead of seeking inspiration from others, what if we focused on becoming an inspiration to others? What if we shifted our focus from consuming to creating, from following to leading, from being a fan to being a role model? As the activist and author Marianne Williamson put it, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. So. How do we unleash our inner light and become a beacon of inspiration for others? 1. Embrace your authenticity. Don't try to be someone you're not. Embrace your quirks, your passions, your unique perspective. The world needs your authentic self, not another carbon copy of someone else. As the poet E. E. Cummings said, to be nobody but yourself in a world which is doing its best, night and day, to make you everybody else means to fight the hardest battle which any human being can fight and never stop fighting. 2. Share your gifts. We all have unique talents, skills and experiences to offer the world. Don't be afraid to share your gifts, whether it's through your work, your art, your volunteering or simply your interactions with others. As the saying goes, your talent is God's gift to you. What you do with it is your gift back to God. 3. Lead with courage. It takes courage to be yourself, 
to stand up for what you believe in and to go against the grain. But it's precisely this courage that inspires others. As the civil rights leader Martin Luther King Jr. said, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. 4. Cultivate compassion. Compassion is the key to connecting with others on a deeper level. It's about seeing the humanity in everyone, regardless of their background, beliefs, or circumstances. As the Dalai Lama said, if you want others to be happy, practice compassion. If you want to be happy, practice compassion. 5. Live with integrity. Your actions should align with your values. Don't just talk the talk, walk the walk. As the philosopher Confucius said, the superior man is modest in his speech, but exceeds in his actions. Let's explore how this concept is applied in daily life. The teacher who inspires. A teacher who is passionate about their subject, who cares deeply about their students, and who creates a safe and supportive learning environment can be a powerful source of inspiration for their students. The artist who creates. An artist who pours their heart and soul into their work, who takes risks and who pushes boundaries can inspire others to express their own creativity. The activist who fights for change. An activist who fights for justice, equality and human rights can inspire others to stand up for what they believe in and make a difference in the world. The bottom line, inspiration is not something you find, it's something you become. By embracing your authenticity, sharing your gifts, leading with courage, cultivating compassion and living with integrity, you can become a beacon of inspiration for others. As the poet Maya Angelou put it, nothing can dim the light which shines from within. So, let your light shine, folks, and inspire others to do the same. Lesson 2. Guilt is worse than jail, your philosophical guide to breaking free from the shackles of shame. All right, folks, let's have a real talk about something that can weigh heavier than a ball and chain. Guilt. We're not talking about the oops, I ate the last cookie kind of guilt. We're talking about the deep-seated, soul-crushing kind that can keep you up at night, haunt your waking hours, and make you feel like you're drowning in a sea of self-loathing. The guilt trip. Guilt is a sneaky little bugger. It masquerades as a moral compass, guiding us towards right action and away from wrongdoing. But it can also become a toxic force, a relentless tormentor that robs us of joy, peace and self-worth. As the philosopher Nietzsche put it, guilt is the most terrible sickness of the soul. It's a heavy burden to carry, a constant reminder of our perceived failures and shortcomings. The prison of the mind Guilt can feel like a prison, trapping us in a cycle of self-blame, shame and regret. It can prevent us from moving forward, forgiving ourselves and embracing the possibility of change. As the writer Maya Angelou said, there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside you. Guilt can be that untold story, a secret shame that we carry with us afraid to share it with others for fear of judgment or rejection. But here's the thing, guilt is a choice. We can choose to let it control us, or we can choose to break free from its grip. The philosophical escape route. The ancient Stoics, like Seneca and Marcus Aurelius, had a lot to say about guilt and shame. They believed that these emotions are not helpful or productive and that we should strive to overcome them. As Seneca put it, we are more often frightened than hurt, and we suffer more in imagination than in reality. In other words, we often make our suffering worse by dwelling on our guilt and shame 
rather than focusing on solutions and moving forward. So, how do we break free from the prison of guilt and reclaim our peace of mind? 1. Acknowledge your feelings. The first step is to acknowledge your guilt and shame. Don't try to suppress it or pretend it doesn't exist. Allow yourself to feel the emotions, but don't let them control you. 2. Take responsibility. If you've done something wrong, take responsibility for your actions. Apologize to those you've hurt, make amends if possible, and learn from your mistakes. 3. Practice self-compassion. Be kind to yourself. Don't beat yourself up over your past mistakes. Remember, you're human and everyone makes mistakes. As the Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh put it, to love oneself is the beginning of a lifelong romance. 4. Focus on the present. Don't dwell on the past. Focus on the present moment and what you can do to make things better. As the saying goes, the past is history, the future is a mystery, but today is a gift. That's why it's called the present. 5. Seek support. If you're struggling with overwhelming guilt or shame, don't hesitate to seek help from a therapist, counselor or spiritual advisor. They can provide you with the tools and support you need to heal and move forward. Let's explore how this concept is applied in daily life. The Apologetic Friend A friend who constantly apologizes for minor mistakes or inconveniences, even when it's not necessary. By practicing self-compassion and accepting that they're not perfect, they can learn to let go of their excessive guilt. The Workaholic A workaholic who feels guilty for taking time off or relaxing. By setting boundaries, prioritizing self-care, and recognizing that rest is essential for productivity, they can break free from the guilt trap and enjoy a more balanced life. The Recovering Addict A recovering addict who struggles with guilt and shame over their past actions. By seeking support from a therapist or support group, practicing self-compassion and focusing on their recovery, they can learn to forgive themselves and move forward. The bottom line, guilt is a heavy burden to carry. It can rob us of joy, peace and self-worth. But it doesn't have to control us. By acknowledging our feelings, taking responsibility, practicing self-compassion, focusing on the present and seeking support, we can break free from the shackles of shame and create a life that's filled with love, forgiveness and inner peace. As the poet Maya Angelou put it, there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside you. So, tell your story, forgive yourself, and let go of the guilt. Lesson 3. Kindness is always the right response, but it ain't always easy, folks. Your philosophical guide to being a decent human. All right, folks, let's talk about kindness, not the hold-the-door-open-for-someone kind of kindness, but the deep-down, soul-level kind that radiates from within and touches the lives of everyone you meet. We're talking about the kind of kindness that can heal wounds, bridge divides, and make the world a better place. The kindness conundrum. Kindness seems like a no-brainer, right? Be nice to people, treat them with respect, Lend a helping hand when you can, but in today's world of social media trolls, political polarization and road rage, kindness can feel like a radical act. As the Dalai Lama put it, my religion is very simple, my religion is kindness. But he also acknowledged that practicing kindness is not always easy. It requires effort, patience and a willingness to look beyond our own self-interest. The philosophical foundation, the ancient philosophers like Confucius and Aristotle, understood the importance of kindness and compassion. They saw it as a fundamental virtue, 
essential for living a good life and creating a harmonious society. As Confucius said, do not do to others what you do not want done to yourself. This simple principle, known as the Golden Rule, is found in many different cultures and religions around the world. It's a reminder that kindness is not just a nice-to-have, it's a fundamental ethical principle. The Ripple Effect Kindness is not just about making others feel good, it's also about making yourself feel good. When we act with kindness, our brains release oxytocin, a hormone that's associated with trust, bonding and happiness. Kindness also has a ripple effect, inspiring others to be kind in return. As the saying goes, kindness is contagious. When we act with kindness, we create a more positive and supportive environment for ourselves and others. The Kindness Toolkit 1. Practice empathy. Put yourself in the other person's shoes. Try to understand their perspective, their feelings and their motivations. As the psychologist Brene Brown put it, empathy is not connecting to an experience, it's connecting to the emotions that underpin an experience. 2. Listen actively. Listen to what others have to say, without interrupting or judging. Show genuine interest in their thoughts and feelings. As the author Stephen Covey put it, most people do not listen with the intent to understand, they listen with the intent to reply. 3. Offer. Help. Look for opportunities to help others, even in small ways. Hold the door open for someone, offer a compliment, or lend a listening ear. As the saying goes, no act of kindness, no matter how small, is ever wasted. 4. Forgive freely. Holding on to anger and resentment is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Forgiveness is not about condoning bad behavior, it's about freeing yourself from the burden of negativity. 5. Be kind to yourself. Kindness starts with ourselves. Treat yourself with compassion, understanding and forgiveness. As the poet Maya Angelou put it, Love yourself first and everything else falls into line. Let's explore how this concept is applied in daily life. The rude customer. Instead of snapping back at a rude customer, the kind salesperson takes a deep breath, listens to their complaint and tries to find a solution. The stressed out parent. Instead of yelling at their kids, the kind parent takes a break practices some self-care and then addresses the situation with patience and understanding. The Online Troll Instead of engaging in a flame war with an online troll, the kind person chooses to ignore them or respond with a calm and respectful message. The Bottom Line Kindness is not just a nice-to-have, it's a superpower. It has the power to heal, to connect, to inspire, and to transform. By practicing empathy, active listening, offering help, forgiving freely and being kind to ourselves, we can unleash the power of kindness and make the world a better place. As the poet Rumi put it, let the beauty of what you love be what you do. Lesson 4. A Higher Pleasure your philosophical upgrade to a life that's lit and not just a sugar rush. All right, folks, let's talk about pleasure. No, we're not talking about the fleeting thrills of a sugar rush or the instant gratification of a dopamine hit. We're diving deeper into the concept of higher pleasure, a more lasting, meaningful and soul-satisfying kind of enjoyment that can elevate your life from meh to hell yeah, the Pleasure Paradox We live in a world that's obsessed with pleasure. We're constantly bombarded with messages telling us to indulge, to treat ourselves, to seek out the next big thrill. But here's the thing. Not all pleasures are created equal. Some pleasures are fleeting, leaving us feeling empty and craving more. 
Others are more enduring, enriching our lives and contributing to our overall well-being. As the philosopher John Stuart Mill put it, it is better to be a human being dissatisfied than a pig satisfied. Better to be Socrates dissatisfied than a fool satisfied. In other words, some pleasures are simply better, more valuable, and more worthy of our pursuit than others. The Hierarchy of Happiness Mill's idea of higher and lower pleasures might seem a bit snobby at first, but it's actually a pretty insightful concept. He argued that pleasures that engage our intellect, our creativity, our emotions, and our moral sensibilities are ultimately more satisfying and fulfilling than those that merely gratify our basic physical needs. Think of it like this. Eating a delicious meal is a pleasure, but it's a lower pleasure. It satisfies a basic physical need, but it doesn't necessarily enrich your life or expand your horizons. On the other hand, reading a thought-provoking book, having a deep conversation with a friend, or creating a work of art can be considered higher pleasures. They engage your mind, your heart, and your soul, leaving you feeling more fulfilled and connected to the world around you. So, how do we cultivate a taste for these higher pleasures and elevate our happiness game? 1. Expand your horizons. Don't limit yourself to the same old routines and habits. Explore new interests, try new activities, and challenge yourself to step outside your comfort zone. As the philosopher Alain de Botton put it, anyone who isn't embarrassed of who they were last year probably isn't learning enough. 2. Engage your mind. Read books, watch documentaries, attend lectures, and engage in conversations that challenge your thinking and expand your knowledge. As the physicist Richard Feynman said, the first principle is that you must not fool yourself, and you are the easiest person to fool. 3. Cultivate your creativity. Express yourself through art, music, writing, or any other creative outlet that speaks to you. As the artist Frida Kahlo said, I paint self-portraits because I am so often alone, because I am the person I know best. 4. Connect with others. Build meaningful relationships with people who inspire you, challenge you, and support you. As the philosopher Aristotle put it, man is by nature a social animal. 5. Give back. Find ways to contribute to your community, whether it's volunteering your time, donating to charity, or simply being kind and helpful to others. As the saying goes, the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others. Let's explore how this concept is applied in daily life. The foodie philosopher. The foodie philosopher doesn't just eat to satisfy their hunger. They savor each bite, appreciate the culinary artistry, and explore different cuisines and cultures. They understand that food is not just fuel, it's a source of pleasure, connection, and cultural expression. The art enthusiast. The art enthusiast doesn't just look at art, they experience it. They visit museums, galleries, and art festivals. They read about art history, attend lectures, and engage in conversations about art. They understand that art is not just decoration, it's a window into the human soul. The Lifelong Learner The lifelong learner is always seeking out new knowledge and skills. They take courses, attend workshops, read books, and listen to podcasts. They understand that learning is not just a means to an end, it's a source of joy and fulfillment in itself. The Bottom Line A higher pleasure is not about denying yourself simple pleasures or becoming a snobby elitist. It's about expanding your horizons, engaging your mind, cultivating your creativity, connecting with others, and giving back to the world. 
It's about living a life that's rich in meaning, purpose and joy. As the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche put it, without music, life would be a mistake. But we could also say, without higher pleasures, life would be a missed opportunity. So, go out there and explore the world, folks. There's a whole universe of higher pleasures waiting to be discovered. Lesson 5. Always love. Your philosophical guide to radical loving and why it's not just for hippies. All right, folks, let's talk about love. Not the sappy, hallmark card kind of love, but the real deal. The deep, abiding, unconditional love that can heal wounds, mend fences, and make the world a brighter place. We're not talking about the butterflies in your stomach, infatuation kind of love, but the kind that endures through thick and thin, the kind that makes you a better person. The Love Illusion We live in a culture that often romanticizes love. We're bombarded with images of perfect couples, fairy tale weddings, and passionate love affairs. But the truth is, love is not always easy. It requires effort, compromise, forgiveness, and a willingness to put someone else's needs before your own. As the philosopher Eric Fromm put it, love is not something natural. Rather, it requires discipline, concentration, patience, faith, and the overcoming of narcissism. It isn't a feeling, it is a practice. The philosophical foundation. The ancient Greeks had four different words for love. Eros, romantic love, philia, friendship, storge, familial love, and agape, unconditional love. Each of these types of love has its own unique qualities and challenges. But what all these forms of love have in common is the willingness to connect with another human being on a deep level, to see them for who they truly are and to accept them, flaws and all. As the philosopher Plato put it, love is a serious mental disease. While Plato may have been a bit dramatic, he was on to something. Love can be all-consuming, irrational and even a little bit crazy but it's also one of the most powerful and transformative forces in the universe. The power of love. Love has the power to heal, to inspire, to motivate and to transform. It can bring us joy, peace and a sense of belonging. It can also challenge us, push us to grow and help us become better versions of ourselves. As the poet Maya Angelou put it, love recognizes no barriers. It jumps hurdles, leaps fences, penetrates walls to arrive at its destination full of hope. So, how do we cultivate this radical kind of love in our lives? 1. Practice unconditional love. Love without conditions, without expectations, without strings attached. This doesn't mean being a doormat or accepting bad behavior. It means loving someone for who they are, not for what they can do for you. 2. Be present. When you're with the people you love, be fully present. Put away your phone, turn off the TV, and give them your undivided attention. Listen to them, connect with them, and show them that you care. 3. Forgive freely. Everyone makes mistakes. Holding on to anger and resentment only hurts you. Forgive those who have wronged you, not for their sake, but for your own. As the saying goes, forgiveness is not about forgetting, it's about letting go of the hurt. 4. Express your love. Don't just assume that the people you love know how you feel. Tell them, show them, write them a letter, give them a hug, do something special for them. As the Beatles sang, all you need is love. 5. Love yourself. You can't truly love others until you love yourself. Practice self-compassion, self-care and self-acceptance. As the saying goes, you can't pour from an empty cup. Let's explore how this concept is applied in daily life. 
The family that stays together. A family that goes through a crisis, a job loss, a health scare, a natural disaster, but comes out stronger on the other side because of their love and support for each other. The couple that weathers the storm. A couple that faces challenges in their relationship, infidelity, financial stress, parenting struggles, but chooses to work through them together because their love is stronger than their problems. The community that rallies. A community that comes together to support a neighbor in need, to fight for social justice, or to celebrate a shared victory. The bottom line. Love is not just a feeling, it's a choice. It's a decision we make every day to show up for the people we care about, to forgive their shortcomings, and to celebrate their strengths. By practicing unconditional love, being present, forgiving freely, expressing our love and loving ourselves, we can create a world that's more compassionate, connected, and joyful. As the poet Rumi put it, Love is the bridge between you and everything. Lesson 6. Revenge is a dish best not served. Your philosophical guide to dropping the grudge and why it's not worth the heartburn. All right, folks, let's talk about revenge. Not the Kill Bill or John Wick kind of revenge, although those movies are undeniably entertaining. We're talking about the real-life urge to get even, to settle the score, to make someone pay for the wrongs they've done. We're talking about the kind of revenge that can consume you, poison your relationships, and leave you feeling empty and bitter. The Revenge Roller Coaster Let's face it, revenge can feel pretty damn good in the moment, it's a rush of adrenaline, a sense of righteous indignation, a feeling of power and control. But here's the thing, revenge is a fleeting high. It's like junk food for the soul. It might taste good in the moment, but it leaves you feeling empty and unsatisfied in the long run. As the philosopher Francis Bacon put it, revenge is a kind of wild justice. But we could also say, Revenge is a dish best not served at all. The Philosophical Reality Check The ancient philosophers like Confucius and Marcus Aurelius understood the dangers of revenge. They saw it as a destructive force that could consume us, poison our relationships, and ultimately lead to our own downfall. As Confucius said, Before you embark on a journey of revenge, dig two graves. In other words, revenge hurts not only the person you're seeking revenge against, but also yourself. It's a lose-lose situation. The Forgiveness Antidote So what's the alternative to revenge? Forgiveness. Now I know what you're thinking. Forgive that jerk who wronged me? Are you crazy? But hear me out. Forgiveness doesn't mean condoning the other person's behavior or letting them off the hook. It means choosing to let go of anger, resentment, and the desire for revenge. It means freeing yourself from the emotional baggage that's weighing you down. As the Archbishop Desmond Tutu put it, Forgiveness is not just a nice idea, it's the way we heal the world. Why forgiveness is the bomb. 1. Emotional Liberation Holding on to anger and resentment is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Forgiveness frees you from the negative emotions that are poisoning your soul. 2. Mental Clarity When you're consumed by thoughts of revenge, it's hard to think clearly or make rational decisions. Forgiveness allows you to clear your head and focus on what's truly important. 3. Relationship Repair Revenge can destroy relationships, but forgiveness can heal them. By choosing to forgive, you open the door to reconciliation, understanding, and a deeper connection with the person who wronged you. 4. Personal Growth Forgiveness is not a sign of weakness, it's a sign of strength. 
It takes courage to let go of anger and resentment, and it's an act of self-love to free yourself from the burden of negativity. Let's explore how this concept is applied in daily life. The Workplace Betrayal Instead of plotting revenge against a co-worker who stole your idea, focus on your own success. Let your work speak for itself and trust that karma will eventually catch up with the wrongdoer. The Relationship Rupture Instead of bad-mouthing your ex to all your friends, focus on healing and moving on. Forgive them for their mistakes, learn from the experience, and open yourself up to the possibility of new love. The Personal Slight Instead of holding a grudge against someone who insulted you, try to understand their perspective. Maybe they were having a bad day, maybe they were projecting their own insecurities, or maybe they simply made a mistake. By choosing to forgive, you can rise above the pettiness and maintain your inner peace. The Bottom Line Revenge is a seductive temptress, but she's not worth the trouble. It's a path that leads to bitterness, resentment, and ultimately, more pain. By choosing forgiveness, you can break free from the cycle of negativity and create a more peaceful, joyful and fulfilling life. As the saying goes, the best revenge is massive success. So, focus on your own growth, your own happiness and your own well-being. Let karma take care of the rest. Lesson 7 the wise don't have problems, your philosophical guide to turning lemons into lemonade and maybe some damn good tequila. All right, folks, let's have a real talk about problems, not the I spilled coffee on my shirt kind of problems, but the real deal, the curveballs, the setbacks, the unexpected challenges that life throws our way. We're talking about the kind of problems that can make you want to pull your hair out, scream into a pillow, or just crawl back into bed and hide from the world. The problem-obsessed culture. We live in a world that's obsessed with problems. The news is full of them, our social media feeds are overflowing with them, and we spend countless hours complaining about them to our friends and family. It's like we're addicted to negativity, constantly dwelling on what's wrong with our lives and the world around us. But here's the thing. The wise don't have problems. They have challenges. They have obstacles. They have opportunities for growth. They see problems not as roadblocks, but as stepping stones on the path to wisdom, resilience, and ultimately, a more fulfilling life. The philosophical reframe. The ancient Stoics like Marcus Aurelius and Epictetus, were masters at reframing problems. They believed that our perception of events is more important than the events themselves. In other words, it's not the problem that matters, it's how we choose to view it. As Epictetus put it, it's not what happens to you, but how you react to it that matters. In other words, we can't always control what happens to us, but we can control our response. We can choose to see problems as challenges, setbacks as opportunities, and obstacles as stepping stones. So, how do we shift our perspective and start seeing problems as opportunities for growth? 1. The Power of Perception the first step is to recognize that our perception of events is subjective. What we see as a problem might be seen as an opportunity by someone else. By changing our perspective, we can change our experience of the event. 2. The obstacle is the way. As Ryan Holiday, a modern-day Stoic, put it, the obstacle is the way. In other words, the challenges we face are not roadblocks, they're the path itself. They force us to grow, to learn, and to become stronger. 3. The Growth Mindset Embrace a growth mindset. 
The belief that our abilities and intelligence can be developed through dedication and hard work. When we see challenges as opportunities for growth, we're more likely to persevere and overcome them. 4. The Serenity Prayer The Serenity Prayer, often used in 12-step programs, offers a powerful reminder of the importance of acceptance and focus. It goes like this. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. 5. The Power of Humor Sometimes the best way to deal with a problem is to laugh at it. Humor can help us diffuse tension, gain perspective, and find the silver lining in even the darkest of clouds. As the comedian Charlie Chaplin said, a day without laughter is a day wasted. Let's explore how this concept is applied in daily life. The Laid-Off Optimist Instead of wallowing in self-pity, the laid-off optimist sees their job loss as an opportunity to explore new career paths, start a business, or pursue a passion project. The Resilient Entrepreneur When faced with setbacks and failures, the resilient entrepreneur doesn't give up. They learn from their mistakes, adapt their strategies, and come back stronger than ever. The Creative Problem Solver the creative problem solver doesn't see problems as insurmountable obstacles. They see them as puzzles to be solved, challenges to be overcome, and opportunities to innovate and create. The bottom line, problems are a part of life, but they don't have to define us. By shifting our perspective, embracing challenges, cultivating a growth mindset, practicing acceptance, and finding humor in the absurdity of it all, we can turn problems into opportunities for growth, learning, and even joy. As the philosopher Nietzsche put it, that which does not kill us makes us stronger. So, next time you face a problem, remember, it's not a problem, it's an adventure. Lesson 8. Try the opposite your philosophical hack for shaking things up and maybe even finding your groove. All right, folks, let's talk about doing the opposite. No, we're not talking about becoming a contrarian just for the sake of it or doing something reckless just to prove a point. We're talking about a deliberate strategic approach to problem solving, decision making and personal growth. We're talking about shaking things up challenging your assumptions and stepping outside your comfort zone to see what happens. The comfort zone conundrum. We humans are creatures of habit. We like routine, predictability and the familiar. We tend to stick to what we know, what's comfortable and what's worked for us in the past. But here's the thing. The comfort zone is a trap. It's a place where we stagnate, where we stop growing where we become complacent and uninspired. As the philosopher Søren Kierkegaard put it, life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. In other words, we can't predict the future, but we can learn from the past and use that knowledge to make better choices in the present. The opposite approach. Trying the opposite is a way of breaking free from the comfort zone and exploring new possibilities. It's about challenging our assumptions, questioning our beliefs, and experimenting with different approaches. As the physicist Richard Feynman said, the first principle is that you must not fool yourself, and you are the easiest person to fool. By trying the opposite, we can expose our blind spots, uncover hidden biases, and gain a fresh perspective on our lives. So, how do we embrace the opposite approach and shake things up? 1. The Contrarian Experiment When faced with a problem or a decision, try doing the opposite of what you would normally do. If you're always trying to please everyone, try saying no more often. If you're always following the rules, try bending them a little, within reason, of course. 
2. The Devil's Advocate Play devil's advocate with your own beliefs and opinions. Try to argue against yourself and see if your arguments hold up under scrutiny. This can help you identify weaknesses in your thinking and strengthen your convictions. 3. The Outsider's Perspective Seek out perspectives that differ from your own. Talk to people from different backgrounds, cultures and walks of life. Read books and articles that challenge your worldview. By exposing yourself to different viewpoints, you can broaden your understanding of the world and avoid getting stuck in an echo chamber. 4. The Creative Spark Trying the opposite can be a powerful catalyst for creativity. When we break out of our routines and habits, we open ourselves up to new ideas, new connections, and new ways of seeing the world. 5. The Growth Mindset Embrace a growth mindset, the belief that our abilities and intelligence can be developed through dedication and hard work. By trying new things and stepping outside our comfort zones, we can learn, grow, and become better versions of ourselves. Let's explore how this concept is applied in daily life. The Introverted Extrovert An introvert who always shies away from social situations decides to try the opposite. They join a club, attend a party, or strike up a conversation with a stranger. They discover that they actually enjoy socializing and make some new friends in the process. The Risk Averse Adventurer a person who's always played it safe decides to take a leap of faith. They quit their job to start a business, travel to a foreign country or try a new sport. They discover that they're more capable and courageous than they ever thought possible. The Stubborn Negotiator A negotiator who always takes a hard line decides to try a more collaborative approach. They listen to the other side's perspective seek common ground, and find creative solutions that benefit everyone involved. The bottom line, trying the opposite is not about being contrary for the sake of it. It's about challenging your assumptions, expanding your horizons, and discovering new possibilities. It's about breaking free from the comfort zone and embracing the unknown. As the philosopher Albert Camus put it, the only way to deal with an unfree world is to become so absolutely free that your very existence is an act of rebellion. So, go out there and rebel against the status quo, folks. Try the opposite and see where it takes you. Lesson 9. Adversity Reveals Your Philosophical Boot Camp for Turning Trials into Triumphs All right, folks. Let's talk about adversity. No, we're not talking about minor inconveniences like a spilled coffee or a missed bus. We're talking about the real deal, the curveballs, setbacks, and challenges that life throws our way when we least expect it. We're talking about the stuff that tests our limits, pushes us out of our comfort zones, and forces us to dig deep within ourselves to find strength, resilience, and a whole lot of grit. The Adversity Illusion We often see adversity as a negative thing, something to be avoided at all costs. We try to control our environment, plan for every contingency, and shield ourselves from pain and discomfort. But here's the thing. Adversity is inevitable. It's part of the human experience, and if we're not careful, our aversion to adversity can actually make us weaker, more fragile, and less equipped to handle life's challenges. As the philosopher Nietzsche famously said, that which does not kill us makes us stronger. But we could also say, that which does not kill us reveals who we truly are. The Philosophical Crucible The ancient Stoics, like Marcus Aurelius and Seneca, understood the transformative power of adversity. They saw it as a crucible, 
a fiery furnace that could burn away our impurities and reveal our true character. As Marcus Aurelius put it, the impediment to action advances action. What stands in the way becomes the way. In other words, adversity is not a roadblock. It's a detour that can lead us to unexpected destinations and hidden strengths. So, how do we turn adversity into our ally and use it as a catalyst for growth and transformation? 1. Embrace the suck. Let's be real. Adversity sucks. It's painful, it's uncomfortable, and it can make us want to curl up in a ball and give up. But the first step to overcoming adversity is to accept it. As the saying goes, what you resist persists. 2. Find the lesson. Every adversity has a lesson to teach us. It might be a lesson about our own strengths and weaknesses, about the importance of relationships, or about the impermanence of life. By reflecting on our challenges, we can gain valuable insights and wisdom that can help us navigate future storms. 3. Cultivate Resilience Resilience is the ability to bounce back from setbacks and challenges. It's about learning from our mistakes, adapting to new circumstances, and finding strength in adversity. As the psychologist Angela Duckworth put it, grit is passion and perseverance for very long-term goals. Grit is having stamina. Grit is sticking with your future, day in, day out. Not just for the week, not just for the month, but for years, and working really hard to make that future a reality. 4. Seek support. You don't have to go through adversity alone. Reach out to friends, family, mentors or therapists for support. Talking to someone you trust can help you process your emotions, gain perspective and find solutions to your problems. 5. Find meaning. Even in the darkest of times, there's always a glimmer of hope. Look for meaning in your suffering, find purpose in your pain, and use your experiences to help others. As Viktor Frankl, a Holocaust survivor and psychiatrist, famously said, those who have a why to live can bear with almost any how. Let's explore how this concept is applied in daily life. The Entrepreneur's Setback A startup founder faces a major setback. Their product launch fails, their funding falls through, or their team quits. Instead of giving up, they analyze their mistakes, pivot their strategy, and come back stronger than ever. The Athlete's Injury An athlete suffers a career-threatening injury. Instead of wallowing in self-pity, they dedicate themselves to rehabilitation, find new ways to train, and eventually return to their sport even stronger than before. The Cancer Survivor A cancer survivor faces a grueling battle with their disease. Instead of giving up hope, they find strength in their faith, their family and their community. They use their experience to raise awareness, support other cancer patients and advocate for better treatment options. The bottom line, adversity is not something to be feared, it's something to be embraced. It's an opportunity for growth, a catalyst for change, and a test of our character. By facing our challenges head-on, we can discover our hidden strengths, develop resilience, and create a life that's truly meaningful and fulfilling. As the poet Maya Angelou put it, we may encounter many defeats, but we must not be defeated. Lesson 10 no self-flagellation needed. Your philosophical guide to ditching the inner critic and embracing your perfectly imperfect self. All right, folks, let's have a real talk about something we all do, but probably shouldn't. Beating ourselves up. No, we're not talking about hitting the gym, although that's good for you. We're talking about the mental self-flagellation, the endless loop of negative self-talk the inner critic that constantly whispers, 
you're not good enough, you're a failure, or you'll never amount to anything. The Inner Critic's Reign of Terror We all have an inner critic. It's that voice in our heads that judges, criticizes and compares us to others. It's the voice that tells us we're not smart enough, pretty enough, successful enough, or worthy enough. It's the voice that keeps us playing small, doubting our abilities, and holding ourselves back from reaching our full potential. As the psychologist Brene Brown put it, shame is the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. Our inner critic is often fueled by shame, a deep-seated belief that we're inherently flawed and unlovable. The Philosophical Antidote The ancient philosophers, like the Stoics and Buddhists, understood the dangers of self-criticism and the importance of self-compassion. They taught us to cultivate a more balanced and realistic view of ourselves, to accept our flaws and imperfections, and to treat ourselves with kindness and understanding. As the Buddha said, you yourself, as much as anybody in the entire universe, deserve your love and affection. So, how do we silence that inner critic and embrace a more compassionate, self-accepting approach to life? 1. Awareness The first step is to become aware of your inner critic. Notice when it starts to chatter away, pay attention to the words it uses, and recognize the negative impact it has on your emotions and your behavior. 2. Challenge Don't just accept your inner critic's harsh judgments as truth. Challenge them with evidence to the contrary. Remind yourself of your strengths, your accomplishments, and the positive qualities that others see in you. 3. Reframe Instead of using negative self-talk, reframe your thoughts in a more positive and empowering way. For example, instead of saying, I'm such an idiot, say, I made a mistake, but I'm learning from it. 4. Practice self-compassion Treat yourself with the same kindness and understanding that you would offer to a friend. Forgive yourself for your mistakes. Acknowledge your struggles and celebrate your successes. 5. Focus on your values. Instead of getting caught up in the comparison trap, focus on your own values and goals. What kind of person do you want to be? What kind of life do you want to live? By focusing on your values, you can create a more meaningful and fulfilling life regardless of what others think or say. Let's explore how this concept is applied in daily life. The Perfectionist The perfectionist is constantly striving for unattainable standards, setting themselves up for disappointment and self-criticism. By practicing self-compassion and accepting their imperfections, they can learn to appreciate their efforts and celebrate their successes. The procrastinator. The procrastinator often beats themselves up for not being productive enough. By breaking down tasks into smaller chunks, setting realistic goals, and rewarding themselves for their progress, they can overcome procrastination and build self-confidence. The social comparison addict. The social comparison addict is constantly comparing themselves to others, feeling inadequate and insecure. By unfollowing social media accounts that trigger negative emotions, focusing on their own strengths and accomplishments, and cultivating gratitude, they can break free from the comparison trap and find more joy and contentment in their lives. The bottom line. Self-flagellation is not a path to self-improvement. It's a destructive habit that can lead to anxiety, depression, and a host of other mental and emotional problems. By cultivating self-awareness, challenging negative self-talk, practicing self-compassion, 
focusing on your values and seeking support when needed. You can silence your inner critic and embrace your perfectly imperfect self. As the poet Maya Angelou put it, there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside you. So, tell your story, embrace your flaws, and let go of the self-flagellation. You are enough. All right, folks, that's a wrap. Remember, being inspirational comes from within. Guilt doesn't have to imprison you. Kindness is a strength, and higher pleasures are worth pursuing. Take these lessons to heart and watch how they transform your life. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up, share it with someone who needs a bit of philosophical wisdom, and don't forget to subscribe for more insights. Until next time, stay curious and keep shining your light.